Mo Gaudat, welcome to the Personal Best Podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. How are you doing, first of all? Uh, oh, <laughs> I, I learned over time to never answer and say, I'm doing really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had, um, on January 4th, one of the biggest panic attacks of my life uh, because uh, somehow everyone woke up in the morning and started to bombard me with what immediately translated into I'll be very burnt out by the end of February. And, uh, you know, every minute of my time was booked until March 18th. So I did what I believe was the best move I ever did. I cut out around uh, 60% of all of the things I was planning to do in the year. Uh, I last year I was doing 18 full-time jobs. Now I'm only doing seven. Well done, Mo. And, uh, and for that, I feel amazing. I also found love recently and fall, fell madly in love and, <laughs> uh, did what, uh, uh you know, what, uh, an intelligent man would do. So I asked her to marry me and, uh, she did what an intelligent woman would do <laughs> <laughs> and said, well, hmm, he's a good guy. So, uh, I'm very happy about that. Uh, very close to my daughter, very happy about that and very uh, concerned about the world in 2024, but very optimistic Mm -hmm. about how I can positively impact it. It's a wonderful answer and congratulations. I'm so unbelievably happy for you. And I'm very glad that you didn't choose to cut out this podcast from your plans because I've been so looking forward to sitting down with you and being able to pick your brains and have a conversation all about happiness and all about the work that you do. But I just wanted to tell a little story for all our listeners about how this podcast actually came about because I think it's quite sweet. So if people have been listening, they'll know that I have a part-time waitressing job in a restaurant in Notting Hill. It's not my end goal of my career, but it's enjoyable. And one evening I was working a shift and Mo walked in and any of my colleagues will know I instantly felt so excited and nervous and I couldn't believe it and we ended up having a little chat and you said to me, so when can I come on your podcast? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, that would be a dream come true. And here you are. So thank you so much and I can't wait to um, see what this conversation holds. Yeah, I uh, first of all, it was lovely that you, you, you said hi, honestly, very kind of you. And uh, yeah, I hope that this conversation makes, makes this podcast incredibly successful. Thank you. You so, deserve it, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So obviously this is the Personal Best Podcast and I have kind of said my mission statement is to help people live healthier, happier lives and ultimately become the best version of themselves. Mm. I've tended to talk a lot about health and and fitness and that side of things, but I also think equally important is this idea of how can we have a healthy mindset and look after our our mental health. So can I just ask you, for everyone listening, to do a little personal introduction, first of all, if they aren't familiar with, with your work. How did you become known as the happiness expert? Ah. Uh, I don't like to be called the happiness <laughs> expert. I, uh, I think of myself as the happiness engineer, think about it this mm-hmm. way. And occasionally I get called that. I am uh, one of the luckiest people you've ever met by a very long margin. Uh, I have a very important theory on luck that luck doesn't just land on you. But somehow I think my mindset uh, growing up allowed me to be open to luck when it showed up. Mm. And... Uh, because of that, though, though I'm, uh, you know, born in Egypt, uh, raised in Egypt, public school, public university in Egypt, uh, I ended up having an, a wild career. Like <laughs> I, I worked at IBM and Microsoft and Google. Uh, at the time, those companies were truly changing the world. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my, my last 12 years of corporate career were at Google, where I first was uh, vice president of emerging markets. So I started half of Google's businesses globally. Uh, and then I spent the last five years as chief business officer of Google X, which is the innovation arm of Google, second best job on the planet. And, uh, you know, you have to wonder 
how I got there and why I got there, but I did. So mm. I had the most incredibly lucky and fortunate career, if you want. And, um, and at the same time, I was miserable. And uh, it's not unlikely in our modern world to keep setting goals and achieving them and then feeling that they're empty and then setting more goals and achieving them. Yeah. Uh, I started that feeling, and I, I always say part of being so lucky is I had my middle age crisis when I was nine. Uh, sorry, when I was 29. <laughs> I wish it was nine. Uh, <laughs> when I was 29, because I basically at 29, I had everything, everything that the modern world tells you to have. Mm. Okay. Beautiful wife, two lovely kids. I had, uh, you know, big villa with a swimming pool and, you know, several cars and uh, all the money. And I, I, you know, and I was miserable truly miserable and uh, at the time I had to find my way out of misery by uh, using the only thing I know which was my engineer's mind uh, yeah. you know, in a very uh, unusual way I think I went through a journey of being all heart uh, to being old brain to finally finding balance but in the stage where I was very uh, unhappy I was all brain and as all brain I just couldn't get it I just couldn't understand you know and 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 happiness to me was a, a, a classical engineering problem. The machine used to work well. I was happy when I was young and the machine broke. So I need to find out which part I need to replace. Mm, uh, which, how to fix it. Yeah, which bit of the code I need to fix, basically. I was literally looking at it as a software developer. And then my wonderful son, Ali, was my heart, if you want. Uh, so he would uh, advise me on my discoveries that are so dry and so mathematical and algorithmic and process oriented. <laughs> and he would say, you know, he would sit and listen and smile. And, you know, he was very, very wise, even as an eight year old. Uh, and he would then eventually say, yeah, Papa, that's amazing. You could have just asked me. <laughs> and, and then he would tell me something that is f normally four to eight words that are from the heart that would complete the picture. Ali, as some uh, of your listeners may know, and um, you know, some may not, uh, unfortunately left our world uh, because of a medical uh, error uh, yeah. in a very simple surgical operation. Uh, now, 10 years ago, almost, uh, when he was 21. <coughs> and he, uh, when he left, he, I think, set things right. Because, uh, you know, you suddenly you just, you just find out what matters in life. Uh, yeah. And, and when, he, when he left, I went on that mission uh, in an attempt to honor him. You know, death has a finality to it. You, 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 you can't bring them back, right? But, uh, but, uh, but in, a, in a way, I just thought if I could uh, teach the world what he taught me, uh, then his essence will always be alive. Yeah. And so like a businessman, I set myself a quota. At the beginning, it was 10 million happy. And I went for it. I wrote a book that became an international bestseller, Soul for Happy. Uh, and then I, you know, I went out with all the knowledge I have, all the contacts I have to spread that message. It became viral very, very, very quickly. And so we moved the mission from 10 million happy to 1 billion happy. And it's been my work, my life's work since, yeah. basically. I mean, your story is just remarkable. I remember I first heard you on Elizabeth Day's podcast, oh, yes. How to Fail. I, I love her work as well. And I just think you've obviously lived, I think, as you said, like almost two separate lives. Two lives, yeah. And within that, you've learned so many important lessons around what it means to be happy and how to live a fulfilled life. And... It's just amazing how you've been able to share those with so many people. And there's so much I want to unpack from your story. But the very first question is, can you give me your definition of happiness? Because I think it's something we hear all the time. People yeah. saying, I just want to be happy. But yeah. what does that actually mean? Yeah, you see, you're, you're thinking like an engineer already. So you, you see, the, the, the problem is, if you don't know what you're looking for, you're never going to find it. Yeah. Correct? And, uh, and you know, happiness is highly, dis, you know, dis, distorted as a perception by our modern day advertising. Because, you know, if you believe the modern day advertising, then it seems that a private jet should make you happy or a can of Coke should make you happy, mm. right? 
and and I you know I I literally that was the first question I attempted to solve what is happiness right and and it's you know there are let's say um, you know several misconcepts about it you know what is happiness where is happiness okay uh, you know what can I do to achieve happiness and and the modern world will tell you happiness is sort of mixed up with fun yeah okay uh, having a good time is happiness. Uh, the modern world will tell you and you know there are things you have to get from outside you you have to acquire those to make yourself happy and uh, you know and and basically uh, it's a strive it's a, you know it's a it's a it's a quest you're out there you know and there are things you have to do and things you have to acquire and so on which is all not true at all mm. you look at a child and every child that has uh, ever been born if if they are born in, a, in an environment that provides them with their basic needs. Yeah. So they are fed, they are safe, nobody's shouting in their ears, they are loved because that's one of our basic needs. They're happy, okay? They are lying on their back, uh, they're playing with their toes and they're giddy, <laughs> right? And it's really interesting, huh? You, and I, I mean that with uh, you know all due respect, you're not a child anymore, but on a Sunday morning when you're given your ba ba basic needs, hmm, so you're, uh, safe, you're, you're uh, uh, um, fed, you're calm, you're loved, you, you know, you're happy. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're lying on your back and you're playing with your toes and you're giggling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting when you think about it, because then that means that happiness is not that fun going to the pub and having a couple of drinks and jumping up and down. Okay. It's not at all. Mm -hmm. So, so what is happiness? And I think the biggest eye opener for me was, um, you know, again, in mathematics, if you want to find out what something is, you have to find out something that's constantly what it is. If it changes over time, it's not what yeah, it is. Yeah, you need the constant. Yeah, it needs, yeah. It's need, it needs to be consistent. And so happiness seems to be um, a, 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 associated in the modern world with certain events make us happy, right? Uh, you know, dating a, a tall, beautiful uh, model uh, makes you happy. That's what they tell you. But how often did you date an, a gorgeous person and they made you miserable, mm -hmm. right? How, you know, oh, uh, sunshine makes you happy. Uh, of course, how, you know, we remember summer of, uh, was it two years ago when it was sunny for the whole summer and Hyde Park became a high desert and everything uh, was burning down and sunshine wasn't making you happy, right? And you start to question if, you know, if something is not consistently making you happy, then it's not what that thing is happiness is not the result of events in your life hmm? I, I always joke and say rain makes you very happy uh when it's your ex-boyfriend's wedding right <laughs> so 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 the truth is it changes huh? and in my mathematical brain i said okay so what is the other variable in the equation hmm, that makes that become true right because if happiness does not equal uh, the events of my life, then there must be another parameter, uh, A equals B plus C, right? Or minus C or whatever. Uh, and, and, and believe it or not, the, param the other parameter makes everything clear. Hmm? Your happiness is not the result of what life gives you. Your happiness is the result of a comparison that happens in your head between what life gives you or whatever it is that, you're, uh, that is your current state and what you want life to give you, right? You want it to rain on your ex-boyfriend's wedding. So when it rains, you're happy. If it doesn't, you'll be unhappy. Yeah. Right. And and uh, you know when when you realize that, so you, you know it's, it can be summarized in a very simple you know uh, uh, mathematical equation. Uh, happiness is equal to or greater than the difference between the events of your life and your expectations of how life should be. Right. And when you see it that way, you realize that happiness is a moment when you're okay with life as it is. It doesn't yeah. matter what life is. Okay. What matters is that you're okay with it. Yeah, hmm? you, I think you use the phrase like life going my way. Life That's goes what it your feels way. Like. Exactly, it feels like life is going my way. It has my best interest in mind. Okay, and once I get that realization, what do I feel? I feel a calm and peaceful contentment. I don't feel elation. I don't feel excitement. I don't feel that adrenaline is rushing through my body. I don't feel the ego of driving a fancy car. I don't, which all seem to give you little jolts of dopamine hmm, that make you think that you're happy, but the truth is they don't. Hmm? Happiness is I'm calm and peaceful and contented. I wouldn't mind 
if this moment lasted forever. Mm -hmm. That is happiness, mm -hmm. okay? So think about it this way. We associate so many big dreams and ambitions with happiness. This, this moment you and I, that's happiness. Yeah. Okay, it's lovely. It's enough, and it's a nice conversation. Place is beautiful. It's quiet. We're talking about something positive. Yeah, I don't mind if that podcast lasted for four hours, right? Sure. It, it, and that's that feeling, because it's we're so distracted away from it, we don't even seek it. We seek all of the other replacements. Okay, mm. and those other replacements are what I normally refer to as weapons of mass distraction. Right? If you're hmm. and interestingly, biologically when you submerge yourself in them, hmm, it becomes extremely hard to find genuine happiness. So biologically, happiness is serotonin, yeah. right? Serotonin is a calmer. It basically is literally signaling to your body the happiness equation. It's telling your body, everything is okay. I scanned the world around me. You can now rest and digest and have a, a you know, close your eyes, reflect, sleep, whatever, okay? That, by the way, is one of the most important survival needs humans have. We need to be able to rest and digest and feel safe. Yeah. And that's serotonin. All of the other stuff, you know, winning the lottery or meeting a gorgeous woman or whatever, all of that is dopamine. Dopamine is a reward hormone. Okay. Mm. It, it, it comes into your body to say, oh, my God, that feels amazing. Give me more of it. Okay. And it feels amazing. Give me more of it biggest lie in the modern world is that we associate the, associated that with happiness, okay? Right. The problem is the more dopamine in your body, the more your dopamine receptors in your brain would down-regulate. So if I give you 10 units of dopamine to feel excited now, the next time you'll ask me for 11, and the next time you'll ask me for 12, okay? And it's an ever-ending quest. And, and the minute dopamine, you know, injections end, you get into depression. Yeah. This idea is so interesting to me, and I heard you talking about it um, yesterday on the BBC um, Maestro, yeah. Maestro on YouTube. And as soon as you were explaining it, I thought that makes so much sense that almost as we increase our levels of, of dopamine, our, our tolerance to it also increases, right? So yeah. the things that maybe brought us happiness before no longer... Oh, sorry. The things that you know made us feel excited and exactly. um, yeah. and upbeat no longer serve us. Yeah. Um, and though for that very reason, we shouldn't be chasing things that bring us that dopamine. And instead, we should try and find our our calmness and our base level of feeling content. Correct. And something that's I've always wondered with this um topic of happiness is is being happy our natural state i know you spoke about um the baby being happy obviously most of us come into the world as happy excited beings but is that our default state it it is our default state without the conditioning of the modern world okay right it's also our duty believe it or not okay so so let me explain those two it, as i said you you wake up sunday morning hmm? you could be spending the entire uh, uh week you know um, complaining in your head about a professor, a certain professor or a certain boss or whatever. You wake up Sunday morning, it's sunny. Hmm? You don't have any aches or pains in your body. You feel loved. Hmm? You have enough to eat. You have a roof on top of your head. You'll wake up and you'll go, oh, this feels amazing. Hmm. Everything's fine, hmm. right? Uh, then your brain kicks in. Uh, your friend sends you something. You swipe on Instagram, okay? And suddenly not everything is fine anymore. So you think that you're supposed to be stressed and anxious and unhappy all the time. No, you're not. You're just stressed and anxious because of what you're acting, what you're doing. Mm, that okay? makes sense. Right? So if, you, if, if, I, if I tell you, look, I, I want you to sit calm, but I will uh, give you 12 hours of the best horror movies that has, have ever been made. Uh, go ahead, stay calm. It's impossible. I wouldn't. I right? hate horror movies. I hate horror movies, <laughs> right? And, I, and, and it's so funny huh? because many of us will watch horror movies and then question why they get nightmares, mm. right? Uh, you know, many of us will watch violent movies and then question why they feel that the world is not safe, okay? Uh, many of us will engage with people that are upsetting them and treating them badly and then wonder why they feel, uh, uh, you know, less self-worth, hmm? And so on. Many of us will sit behind a, a little screen for 12 hours a day and wonder why we're feeling lonely. 
Hmm? Without all of those conditions, your default state is I'm okay. Yeah, okay. Right? Now, I, I even dared say it's your duty. Okay, now let me explain that. If, if, you, if you and I are sitting in this room and this room is a little cold, hmm? it's your duty to yourself to say I may catch a flu. Right? If you feel a tiny bit of a, a, a sore throat, hmm? it's your duty to yourself to change your habits. Right? When you feel a sore throat, you say, mm, that doesn't feel right. I need to change this. And you do something about it. Right? When it comes to happiness, you don't. When, you, when it comes to happiness, you dwell on it. Hmm? Uh, uh, this is one thing. The other thing is, believe it or not, so, so, so what, before I move to the other thing, so, so that basically means that it is your obligation to your own survival to respond to things that make you unhappy in a way that leads you back to happiness because that state of happiness means I scanned the world around me and it seems okay, right? Mm. Any other feeling is basically telling you something's not right. Hmm? So you can either verify it's not right and then do something about it or verify that it's, no, no, it's actually okay, brain. Hold on, no issues, okay? And then you can go back to your state of happiness. Take that a step further and think about your duty to society, hmm? Hmm. your duty to the ones that you love. Hmm? You, you know, how many of us, me included, have gone into a, a relationship with someone who I made miserable and she made me miserable and we ended up, you know, destroying each other's lives. Why? Why? Well, my, my duty is to, is to work on finding my state of calm and happiness so that you can have a wonderful conversation hmm? mm. and, and the best time on earth, right? My duty is to find calm and happiness so that if we're faced with a challenge at work, you know, I can discuss it with my colleagues and we solve the challenge, right? My duty is to find calm and peacefulness so that we... Uh, don't have to, uh, uh, you know, start violence in the streets or riots or whatever. My duty, if you really, really maximize it, is to find a bit of happiness so that I don't kill others in other nations. Yeah. Right? And, and, and you really, really start to think about it. If everyone was calm and peaceful and contented about life, hmm, would we actually start any wars? Would, you, would we actually do to each other what we're doing to each other? Yeah. Now, of course, you'll tell me, but Mo, you know, life is not always great. You know, I, I have to sometimes be angry about it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. On, on my podcast, you know, I, one of my favorite guests of all time from season one was Aaron Gandhi, uh, grandson of Gandhi, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And, and mm. basically, and, and he wrote a book called The Gift of Anger. And, and, you know, first thing I did is like, I was like, what is that? <laughs> yeah. How can anger be a gift? And, and he said, Mo, anger is an energy. Okay, we all feel it sometimes. Hmm? And an energy is gift, is a gift to you. Hmm? It's what you do with your anger that can be a gift or a yeah. curse, right? And so, yes, of course, the world is not always perfect. Hmm? But it's wise to tell yourself it is not perfect, but I'm okay when I realize that because I'm gonna take the action to make it more perfect, mm. right? I accept my life as it is. I, ex I accept that I ended up in a relationship uh, you know, last year, for example, I had one of the most difficult relationships of my life before I found my 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 lovely Hannah. Right before before that, hmm? yes, I I went in with the intention of this looks right. Turns out very quickly that it wasn't right. Yeah, what is all the unhappiness in the world going to do? I have to suddenly tell myself my my body, my being is telling me something is not right in this. Yeah, hmm? the, yeah. The, the the unhappiness is just telling me. Do something about it. So I sat down with the lovely lady. I said, look, we seem to have a very, very strong mismatch on our values. Is that something we can work through? If it isn't, we can break up, right? No unhappiness, no fights, no... Just honesty. And, and it's just honesty with oneself first. Yeah. Okay? Very beautiful, very attractive, incredibly uh, intelligent woman, you know, very sexy, and yet values mismatch, mm. right? Now, you can choose to tell yourself, I, I don't know what to do. You know, I love all of those things, but this is, I'm going to work on it and I'm going to fix it. Or you can tell yourself, it's not working. I'm not calm and peaceful. I'm not contented. What am I going to do? I'm going to have a very interesting conversation. See if we can, you know, make amends. If we don't, mm. life moves on. But I think the important message in that is that happiness is within your control 100 percent. and i think a lot of people don't realize that and 
maybe try and outsource their happiness to someone else or something, right? Um, whereas actually, like, you have the power within you to make better choices, make better decisions, and take action towards happiness. R- Ruby, there is a utility to being a victim. Mm. You, you, when, when you were a victim as a six-year-old, mommy or daddy or some kind of a stranger in the street came and said, what's wrong, baby? Mm. I know it hurts. I'm really sorry that it hurts. You don't have to do anything about it, baby. It's okay. It's okay. It's going to go away. Yeah. Crap. <laughs> We're not six years anymore, okay? The truth is, hmm, the reason why we want to blame the world for our unhappiness is because it seems to us that happiness is so complex hmm, that we will never achieve it. So instead of adding insult to injury, we might as well just say, well, you know, we're unhappy because the world is, a, is crap. And so, yeah, uh, that way I don't have to blame myself. At least I know it's not me, okay? Mm. How stupid is that? Yeah. I'm, I'm re- I don't mean it in a bad way, but honestly, how effective is that? Why, why don't we? So it, it's really very simple. Huh? By the way, nobody is always happy. I, I, you know, b- because of my work, I interact with the top monks and teachers of happiness in the world, right? And you know, I, I always refer back to Matthew Ricard, which is a wonderful human being, uh, a, a Buddhist monk, sixty thousand hours of lifetime meditation. And, and accordingly, his brain is reconfigured, bigger insula, bigger prefrontal cortex, very, very able to focus and control his thoughts. And, uh, and uh, you know, I hosted him again on my podcast and I said, Matthew, so they, they call you the happiest man in the world. Are you always happy? And he laughs so hard. <laughs> and he has this French accent and he goes like, what are you talking about, me? I'm always pissed off, right? And that's the truth. You can't always be happy. Hmm? Mm. He, 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 you know, his view is that the state of the world and the the way people deal with each other gets to his heart. Yeah, of course. Hmm? Yeah. Unhappiness is a survival mechanism. It's alerting us to something that we need to do something about. Most happiness practitioners don't measure if they can stay happy all the time. We measure the rebounds time. That's interesting. We we, we say okay, an event takes place. It triggers my survival mechanism to tell me this is not right this relationship mo is not right okay she's beautiful she's sexy but hmm, she has a, a values mismatch with you right doesn't mean she's right or i'm right am i right huh? it's just not the same values hmm? the, that alert is important for your survival hmm? whether it's your psychological survival your emotional survival your physical survival hmm? uh, 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 you know it, it, uh, what, a feeling of unhappiness or or worry or fear or anxiety or whatever that's all built into your survival machine right once you do once you, once you get that hmm, the game is you can blame the world say ah oh, you know i ended up here like a six-year-old, really, honestly. Huh? I'm here, I don't know what to do, I'm lost, mommy. Mm. Hmm? Or, or you can say, oh, interesting. Hmm? Thanks, brain, for alerting me that something is not as I want it to be. That's the feeling of unhappiness. What can I do to fix it? How can I respond to it? Okay. Mm. How can I acknowledge to the world that a little part of it is what the world give me? But a big chunk of it is what I'm doing in response to that. Yeah. I love the idea of, uh, yeah, the the rebound between feeling unhappy or pissed off and then trying to get back to actually I feel okay. But the problem is I feel like we all have a slight negativity bias. Of course. And I wanted to ask you, why is it that we focus so much more on the negative things than the positive things? Like why does our brain place so much energy on those things. So, so neuro, neuro, neuroscience will tell you that this is not an illusion. This is true. Huh? The ne- negativity bias, think about it this way. Uh, th- there are more negative words in the English language than positive words, hmm. right? There are more uh, negative emotions uh, uh, listed about humanity than positive emotions. It takes you uh, 12 seconds to remember anything positive. So, so no, let me explain this. They, they ran a study where they would go randomly to people and say, tell me something that happened the, n- last week. Yeah. Okay. 60 to 70% of the time an, a, a, an adult will say something negative that happened last week. Okay. Six to seven out of every 10 times we think 
we think of the negative, not the positive. So negativity bias is true. That's right? so interesting, even thinking about comments on my podcast videos and things. I remember all the negative ones. Oh, yes, absolutely. And they feel... Hurtful. Yeah, so much more than the nice ones make me feel happy. Can I tell you a story about that? When, when, I, when I wrote Soul for Happy and you know my video started to go viral, hmm, I had... Uh, at the same time, around four weeks in, and I'm not, I didn't know anything about the world of social media. Around four weeks in, I had someone from Australia, okay, uh, deliberately and systemically try to convince me that I'm the reason my son died, okay? He, he, star he started Gosh. to say, what did you do to, uh, to prevent it? What did you do to do this? What did you do to do that? And then eventually he started to say, you know, this is your mistake, right? And I, I just like, why? Why? Hmm? At the same time, people started to uh, mock me like, you know, of course, you're the chief business officer of Google X. You have to be happy. Hmm. Right? Uh, you know, people would send comments like, uh, and so how much is that T-shirt? Okay? My, my, you know, my famous T-shirts are between four to 12 pounds, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I just would respond to, to, to those, you know, I'd get one of every seven comments would be negative. Mm. Until I had uh, a Swiss lady uh, text me uh, and say, uh, Mo, uh, literally a month after the book came out, I don't know how she came across the book at all. She said, Mo, uh, I lost my son uh, f three weeks ago uh, uh, to cancer. Level four, he's been struggling for a year and a bit. I lost my daughter hmm, uh, four weeks before mm. hmm, who took her own life because she couldn't see her brother suffering. Mm. So I took my husband and your book and went to the mountains uh, in Switzerland. You have saved our life. Oh, wonderful. For the rest of my life, hmm, I will continue to do what I do for that one comment. Yeah. Do you understand the negativity yeah. bias, huh? Yeah. The negativity bias will get you to be pissed off by someone who says, how big, how much is that T-shirt? Or, you know, attempt to, I'm, I'm guessing that, that the Australian guy had also lost his son and he believes that it's his mistake, okay? And that's why he's pinning it on me, reflecting it on me. Yeah. Uh, or projecting it on me. Uh, and, and I could po forgive him for that. Of course, if he had gone through that experience, he's forgiven. Mm? Uh, but it doesn't matter. You know, I, I'm willing to get 14,000 negative comments if one comment says you've saved our life, right? And, and, and you really have to start recognizing this. You have to start recognizing that for most of us humans, I mean, look at you, Ruby. If, if you live in London, you're wonderful. You're, you know, you're obviously loved. You're obviously uh, blessed in so many ways. Hmm? Yeah, of course, you have to do sometimes extra work and sometimes jobs and the podcast is not doing this, right? By definition, you're one of the luckiest 1% alive, mm. right? And somehow we forget. We forget that we are so lucky that we're not in Gaza or we're not in Syria or we're not in Yemen or, you know, that we were born with no uh, uh, choice of our own, hmm? Uh, in a way that we can actually have a roof on our heads or eat every day. Even those, by the way, who don't. Hmm? Uh, there is always someone less than you. Mm. There's always one step further down you can go. Okay? And, and when you really, you know, I, I always, always refer to the fact that there are three million human trafficked people in the world. Okay? If you're not one of them, hmm, by definition, the fact that your boyfriend's annoying, or the fact that life is a little difficult, or the fact that the tube is never on time, okay? None of that matters. Mm. Mm. And, and, and the, 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 the issue of the negativity bias is that your brain, we were saying, would actually register everything negative that comes in its way instantly. So if I tell you something negative that happened yesterday, your brain will put it in the long-term memory instantly. Okay, for you to, to store a positive experience, you have to focus on it and keep it solely within your uh, um, uh, consciousness for 12 seconds. Mm. There's a quote in your book that says something like, the brain is like Velcro Correct. for negative thoughts and yeah. like Teflon for positive ones. Yeah, I, I don't remember who said it, a uh, very famous uh, 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 Buddhist uh, 
professor, uh, you know, PhD in, in neuroscience. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm so sorry, I forgot the name, but yes, it is. Your, 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 your brain does not want to keep the, it, it sees no value of the negative, of the, of the positive, because, because the negative is what determines it's, a, it's your survival. So it's a survival. It's mechanism. all. It's uh, your 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 brain is a survival machine. Yeah. Right. Like, just like your legs are a survival machine. Right. Uh, your legs are there to take you uh, to run away from the tiger, but then we can use them to run marathons, or we can make them really pretty and attract a mate. Right. You know what? Whatever that is. Mm -hmm. hmm? But the primary function of your legs is to run away from the tiger. <laughs> Similarly, the primary function of your brain hmm, is to scan the world around you and tell you when you're safe and trigger the rest of the machine when you're not, okay? And that's why it looks for the negative. You'd be sitting in front of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the most beautiful scene in, in, in history with a beautiful person next to you and lovely music and a pina colada in your hand, <laughs> and you'll be thinking about, but my boss next week is going to say this, yeah. right? Why? Because your brain doesn't want to give up and say, hey, man, chill. It's good. This is something else that's really interesting is that a lot of our worry and angst is about things that haven't even happened yet. And so it can take away our happiness from the present moment. <laughs> and I heard you talk about this um, in a podcast yesterday. And uh, you said oh, that you stalked me. I did. I've okay. been doing my research. Um, and you were saying that, you know, regrets in the past, anxieties in the future. But right now, if you're listening to this podcast, you can be happy. And I was listening to it, getting my nails done. <laughs> and bef go. before that, I'd been feeling quite anxious and like nervous about today. And then I thought, chill out. I'm OK right now. Like, I'm happy right now. 100%. I mean, so, so there is a lot, a lot in that sentence. Um, if you... If I, 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 the only building block, the foundation on which a thought is created mm. is past or, pre or future. You can't create a thought with no time stamp on it. Do you understand that? Sort of. <laughs> okay, so let, let, let me explain. Any, any, m most, let's say most thoughts hmm, in the present, if they are really anchored in the present, hmm, they're not a thought. They're a narration of the present. Yeah. Okay. This room is a little chilly. Mm. Mm? I cannot say an opinion about that in the present. It wouldn't be in the present. Okay. This room is a little chilly and it may make me catch the flu. Mm? Hopefully it doesn't. Yeah, uh, it's not actually. It's lovely. But it, it's, it's a little chilly and it may make me catch the flu is a thought. The, it may make me catch the flu has a future anchor to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, anything that you ever create that is not a narration of the present yeah, moment is, uh, is uh, you know, is time stamped with the past or the future, okay? Interestingly, past and future thought, generated thoughts are mostly negative. Present stamped thoughts are mostly positive. Let me give you a quick exercise. Hmm? Regret, hmm? regret is a thought that's anchored in the past. Mm. You feel it right now, but it's anchored about something that happened in the past. And its polarity is, it's negative. It makes you feel bad. Yeah. Right? Anxiety. Anxiety is a thought that's anchored in the future. Okay? And y y you feel it right now, but it is focused on the future, and it makes you feel, its polarity is negative. It makes you feel bad. Mm. Okay? If you, if you, uh, in, in Solve for Happy, my first book, I did a, a, a table of around 110 emotions or something. Hmm? The majority of the ones that are anchored in the past or the future are negative. Okay? The majority of the ones that are positive, that make you feel good, excited, elated, happy, calm, and so on, are anchored in the present moment. Okay? All of the, mo all, all of the emotions that are positive, not all, but most, are anchored in the present moment. Hmm? Yet, we choose to think about the past and the future. Mm. When in reality, neither the past nor the future ever existed. Do you understand that? Yeah. Right? So when I, when I uh, um, uh, you know, woke up today and looked at the location and started to calculate the time I need to get here and felt a little anxious, okay, that moment hmm, 
when I felt that way was cold now. It wasn't cold 9 a.m. Mm. Okay? It wasn't cold, you know, two hours ago or three mm. hours ago. <laughs> mm? And I was thinking about when I was going to arrive here. Mm? At that time, it was a, 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 a future moment for me. I, when will I arrive is a future moment for me. That future moment didn't exist until I actually arrived. Right? There has never been a moment in your life that you lived that was called the past. The past happens. When it happens, you call it now. And then it disappears. Yeah. Right? The future doesn't happen until it's now. Yeah. Okay? So th- as a matter of fact, your life is just being propelled forward through a series of nows. Right? Mm. There is never anything else. There is never any point of impact on your life other than this moment of now. Okay? The only reason for past and future is for planning to be safe. Or, you know, past is, is for learning and, and future is for planning to be safe. Hmm? We bring life to those moments by bringing the, by turning them into a thought and replaying them on a, in our heads. Mm. Okay? I call that the Netflix of unhappiness. <laughs> okay? It's unhappiness on demand. Hmm? Why? Because basically, I can take a moment in my last experience and I would refer to that moment and I would say, oh my God, that really hurt me. Right, and somehow I can feel that same pain again, but that moment is over. Without that thought, I don't feel the pain. Without thinking that my son left our world, hmm, I don't feel that my son is dead and not in Boston studying. Mm-hmm. I have to turn it into a thought, okay, to be able to feel the pain. Now, so. So let me put it all together. Huh? All Most negative is anchored in the past or in the future. Most positive is anchored in the present moment. Nothing exists in your brain until you time stamp it with past and future. But fa- past and future never happened. They, they really don't exist. They, you know, the past happens at a moment called now, and then it doesn't exist anymore. You have to give it life to feel the pain. How stupid is that? Okay, so I, 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 I call it abstraction. So I have a technique that really works very well for me. When I find my brain stuck in the past, I say, okay, we're gonna take an appointment, we're gonna sit 30 minutes together, we're gonna take that past experience you've been torturing me with, okay? We're gonna look at it thoroughly, and we're gonna find out what it is that we can abstract from it. What did we learn? You know, uh, how did we end up in it? How can, you know, uh, 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 how could it happen that way? We will take the abstraction and drop the moment. From now on, every time you bring up the moment, I will say, yes, brain, this happened because of ABC. I've learned I'm not going to do it again. Mm. Right? Let me say if I'm afraid about from something, uh, I sit down and I, say, I sit with my brain. And I say, okay, what are you afraid of? Okay, I'm afraid of this and this. How would it happen? When would it happen? What can we do about it? And I turn the, 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 the thought into a plan okay brain we're going to do a b and c to avoid that fear right and i drop the the, the, i drop the thought and i keep the abstraction okay by doing that you bring yourself back to what to the present moment because the learning is useful in the present moment the dwelling on the past isn't okay because the planning is useful in the in the present moment i can use it to guide my life forward Okay, the dwelling or on the future isn't, mm. Mm? and uh, using that abstraction, you suddenly bring yourself back. Even in your in your worried thoughts or regretful thoughts or shameful thoughts, you bring yourself back to the present. Yeah, and when you're in the present, you can touch the world. You can impact your life now. Something that has really stuck with me from your work is this happiness plan, and. You said that when you have an idea about something, you need to ask yourself, is this true? Yeah. And I'm just going to apply a scenario to this um, to kind of explain how it works. Um, So recently I went on a date with somebody. I thought it went quite well. We were talking for quite a while over text message and then silence. Got ghosted to use uh, the modern dating terminology. And... I was really overthinking about it. I was feeling really paranoid. I was having a conversation with my mom and saying, well, he clearly just doesn't like me or he's heard a bad thing from a friend and he doesn't want to see me anymore. So to apply your happiness plan to that, 
I had to ask myself, is this true? And I said no, because this this idea that I've got, this worry that I've got, it's not backed up by facts. And the second part of the happiness plan is, okay, can you do something about it? Mm-hmm. And so I thought, I can do something about it. So I text him and I said, hey, I'm not expecting anything from you, but are you okay? I just wanted to check in. And he replied and he said, yeah, I'm really sorry. I just don't have time to date right now. And because I'm a people pleaser, I didn't know how to tell you. Mm-hmm. So that solved that. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. But the third part of the happiness plan is, okay, if you can't do something about it, can you move on in in a way, in a way that's helpful? And um, I thought that's an interesting point because obviously if I hadn't had a reply from him, I would have then had to to try and just move on in my own way. Yeah. And I just think this idea is so brilliant because it's like we are having a conversation with our brain and that idea in itself is quite foreign to people i wondered if you could just explain this idea (laughs) that like you said earlier like i said to my brain what does that mean how is that conversation (laughs) taking place we're having conversations with our brains all the time all the time the problem is they're not very organized Mm. okay problem is they sound like white noise with 16 people speaking in there yeah. right it needs to be a dialogue hmm? and a dialogue is very straightforward i i you know everyone knows i call my brain becky the becky and, brain yeah and my, 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 <laughs> and my becky is a third party i have conversations with becky okay i'm not crazy by the way everyone is crazy if i'm crazy because we all have conversations with becky right mm. but but the, but the thing here is this the thing is that conversation has to be streamlined so, so s- literally, picture Becky hmm, as someone, you know, little girl who's panicking and speaking all the time, blah, 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 right? And, you know, what would I do? I'd say, hey, Becky, calm down. Hmm? What's bothering you? And I do that in an exercise that I call Meet Becky, okay? Or I let my brain tell me whatever is happening. I take, you know, uh, 25 minutes at a time, like a meditation. Uh, Becky's allowed to say anything, she, you know, uh, she wants to say. I was going to say it wants to say it's my brain, right? Uh, and, and, you know, everything that my brain will say, I will acknowledge. I will write down on a piece of paper. And then I will ask what else, mm. okay? And then my brain will keep coming up with ideas. And then eventually it will run out. I'll say what else and my brain will go like, uh, you're uh, bold. Yeah, but you told me this on idea number <laughs> three, right? And um, yeah, I, I thank, you. Thank, you, thank you, Becky, I'm bold. Don't repeat ideas anymore. What else, right? By listening to our brains, it doesn't. It, the 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 noise, hmm, endless chatter turns into a stream of organized thoughts, mm. right? That's number one. So I listen. Hmm? Most of what I listen to, especially the incessant thinking that makes us unhappy, is not even true. Okay. Yeah. So like you rightly said, he rejected me. Uh, you know, I'm not worthy. Uh, I'm never gonna find love. These are typical things that we tell ourselves, mm. okay? By the way, I don't know who that person is. You're an idiot. I mean, seriously, okay? <laughs> Go think about this, all right? Uh, anyway, uh, uh, but, but that's the truth. Huh? The truth is none of those thoughts are true. None mm, of them exactly. are ever true. Hmm? The only truth is something that is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah. As per the scientific method, it needs to be observed and measured. Mm. Okay? If it isn't true, you drop it. Drop it, yeah. You drop it. And, and 99% of your unhappiness will go away. I promise you, 99% of your unhappiness, because it's just produced by thoughts, will go away. Mm-hmm. Okay? If it isn't true, that sirens basically telling you something in the world is not right. It's not your, the optimum state for your survival. So do something about it. That's step number two, okay? Step number three is Ali died. I can't do anything about it. I can't bring him back. There must be a solution to that. And the solution is very straightforward. You accept what forces your hand and you commit to do the best you can to make life better despite or because of its presence. Okay. Right? That's very straightforward. Huh? You know, uh, uh, um, I, I'm, I'm writing that um, uh, training um, module about love and romance. Mm? Mm, yeah. And, and one of the most difficult parts of it is, you know, I, I know it sounds really weird, but I'm splitting it into different courses. One course is what I call a, a quick course in marketing. Okay. Because in my mind, dating, love isn't, um, 
you know, a, a, a business or a, or a process at all levels is, is a divine feeling that you can't regenerate on demand. Hmm? But dating is an economic model in an interesting way. Hmm? And dating as an economic model uh, su- suffers from supply and demand. Hmm? And supply and demand basically means that we're in a market that's not always working in our favor, if you want. And so marketing is an interesting way to fix that, one of the four P's of marketing is what is known as product, which mm-hmm. is you in that case, unfortunately, okay. right? And yeah, I'll tell you openly, I've had feedback from uh, you know previous wonderful relationships that said that my lifestyle, because I travel all the time, uh, makes me unpredictable. Okay, yeah. is it true? Yes, it is. Okay, I'm very driven by a mission that has the love of my life, my son, in it, you know, at the heart of it. So I always put my, my mission first, right? I live between two countries and I'm traveling around 100 and maybe 200 days a year. Yeah. Yeah, she's right. I acknowledge that. Hmm? Is it true? Yes, it's true. Can I do something to fix it? Hmm? No, I am still driven by my mission. And sadly, my mission is my number one priority, right? Can I do something to accept it and make my life better despite its presence? Of course. I can yeah. find someone who's as busy as I am, okay? Who is completely independent and you know, secure without my presence, okay? Who respects and loves my mission, maybe has a mission of her own. Hmm? And somehow I'd be able to say, that's wonderful, okay? I am what they told you. Hmm? Uh, I am. Uh, unpredictable in terms of any anything that contradicts my mission hmm? but is that something that you like and it's a very simple process when you think about this huh? yeah it okay is. No, now the biggest part of dating and romance i think is that incredible fear of rejection that gets us stuck mm. with horrible candidates okay and you know i i say that because i you know you said personal best hmm? When I worked on happiness at the beginning, I worked on how happiness works, and then I started to work on how unhappiness works. I'm trying to remove the reasons for for unhappiness in the world. And love and romance and dating is one of the biggest reasons for unhappiness in the world, okay? At least in the Western world. Hmm? Uh, So so, so the, the trick here is the following. The trick is because we're so afraid to be rejected, we end up with people that make our life miserable and eventually make us rejected. Okay, the opposite is true. Hmm? You know, so so let's take your your short story, huh? <laughs> is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm gonna say it's a good thing. Great, it's a great thing mm. because my advice is that if you do the mathematics, hmm, the probability of finding someone that is exactly what you need may be one in thousands or tens of thousands. Okay, you have to come across. Hmm? You have to scan through so many people to find the one that you need. Yeah. The biggest reason we end up getting, not getting to the one that we deserve is because we spend time with those we don't. Yeah, we do. <laughs> right? And ex- exactly. The biggest issue, especially <clears throat> in the younger generation where supply and demand is so skewed, there is so much supply. Hmm? So you end up going on dates and you go like, yeah, he's shitty but he's available and look at that cute dimple i'll take the dimple we like convince ourselves you convince yourself so so i ended up with hannah hmm, for one simple reason which is i will never again touch a woman when, you know before I'm, I'm 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 now very committed but i will never again touch a woman that is not 100% of the seven criteria i had written down seven okay? criteria I had I had 18 and then I reduced them to seven because of probabilities. I know this sounds really weird, but yeah, I had seven. I, have, I had a list of seven items yeah. and I said, I'm not going to touch a woman. Doesn't matter how beautiful, doesn't matter how sexy, doesn't matter how funny. Doesn't ha- All seven have to be in there. Okay. And believe it or not, right before I met Hannah, I was in my mind completely convinced that I will never find her. Okay, but probabilities come with a very interesting thing. Most people don't understand this. Simple mathematics, but it changes everything. Okay, if I tell you, Ruby, that if you throw a dice six times, hmm, you are likely, on average mathematics, are going to get a six. You're 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 almost guaranteed to get a six if mathematics work 
uh, you know, uh, reasonably. Uh, you, if you're lucky, you may get the six at the first time. If you're the average person, you will get it on the third time. Okay. Right? Most people say, okay, so I need six trials to get to the six. Okay? The truth is, no, you could get the six on the first trial if you're lucky. Hmm? But more interestingly, if you did two trials, okay, how many trials do you need to get to the six? Four, because you've already done two. Mm -hmm. Mathematics works in your favor the more you're out there. Okay. Okay. So, so basically what I keep telling people is very straightforward. You are going to have to go through 25 shitty experiences before you find one that is amazing. My, my average calculations, no science behind that, is one in 40 people will match you. Mm -hmm. hmm? And every time, you, so you see the mathematics of speed are very interesting. Huh? Every time hmm, you go on a date, and at the end of the date you say, it was really wonderful, you're actually a really nice person, but I'm not going to go for that. Hmm? You would waste one evening. Okay? If you go on another date, you wasted another evening. If you sleep with them, you're wasting two and a half months. Okay? If you sleep with them and then invest in them, hmm, uh, you're probably going to waste a year and a half. Not because they're amazing, not because they're what you're looking for, hmm, but because I put so much into this already. Yeah. True. And, and all our time is limited. So why waste time on people who aren't going to, you're not going to form a good relationship with them. And I'll be honest, I think I, in my, you know, short dating history, I've been so guilty of um, going on a date or two and then thinking, oh yeah, but they're nice and I like this about them and they've got nice eyes and they've got, you know, muscly arms. And those couple dates turn into like three or four months and they, yeah. it's all ended the same. It ends the same every time where I, I, I know this person isn't, right for me isn't the one for me and I call it quits then when I could have called it quits after the second date yeah I mean there, there is there is a there is a theory that I used to say before Hannah uh, but I you know I, I think I think it's important to understand M modern uh, approach to dating assumes hmm, uh, that things are right until they go wrong yeah very true okay that everything's going to be amazing hmm? unless we really never manage to fix it. Mm -hmm. Okay, unless first major happens. I realized, which actually changed my approach in the last couple of years completely, that it's actually healthy to say, this is not going to work unless it's fantastic. Mm. Okay, that, that concept of, yeah, but you know, look at those dimples. They're so I cute. I can fix his narcissistic personality. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're never going to fix anyone. And by the way, why would you? Why would you want to? Why, why would you walk into a, a Rolls Royce showroom and and tell and then say, okay, I'll take one without an engine and no steering wheel. I'll fix it. Mm. Why? Mark Manson has a great quote that it's, if it's not a fuck yes, it's a no. Absolutely. And I've started to it's apply a, that to yeah. my dating life as well. Yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. If it's not, if it's not a fuck yes, it's a hell no. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Yeah. So I could talk for hours, honestly, but I do need to wrap this podcast up somehow. So I'm going to ask you the question I ask every guest, which is if you had to give a piece of advice or a quote or a mantra to help people achieve their personal best, what would it be? Life is a video game. Okay. Are you a gamer? No. Okay, Not what are all. what are you doing with your life? I uh, know. So, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, in general, it doesn't have to be a video game, but life is a game. Life is what is known in uh, in uh, applied mathematics as an infinite game. Hmm. Okay, uh, there are two types of games. There is a you know there are uh, finite games like tennis is a finite game, chess is a finite game. You're playing to a goal. You finish the goal, the game is over, right? An infinite game has no goal and no ending point. So as as such, an infinite game has one purpose, and the purpose is to play, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and you're playing for one simple reason. Interestingly, the podcast is your personal best. Hmm? You're, simple, you're playing for one simple reason. So I, so I, I played uh, games my whole life. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a, a geek from my young age, and then I was presented with Ali and Aya, my wonderful son and daughter, who are both uh, serious gamers. And... Uh, 
when I used to play games with Ali, uh, I would treat infinite games as finite. So I would start a game and I would run to the end of the level. Mm-hmm. Okay? And Ali would literally put his controller down and say, Papa, why are you doing this? And I'm going like, the end of the level is here. Let's run for it. Right? Yeah. And he goes like, who wants to get to the end of the level? We're playing. Mm. Right? We're playing. We're one, we want to enjoy that experience that we have. Okay? And so, so basically what that meant is that he would go to the places of the game where there is explosion and smoke. <laughs> okay? And I go like, Ali, but why there? And he says, this is, this is the best part of the game. This is where all the fun is. Yeah. Right? In his own words, this is where you develop and grow. Okay. Okay. This is where you become a better gamer, right? So interesting when you look at life. Hmm? If you look at life as an infinite game, you push the controller forward for 70 years and die. Okay? It's not the game. Hmm? The game of life is all of those moments where there is explosion and smoke. Mm. It's that date that you go on and then he doesn't text back. Hmm. Right? And then you learn the skill, by the way, fantastic skill of texting him and saying, hey, I want to check in just so that I decide if I want to move on or not. Yeah. Actually, you could be that blunt. Yeah. Right? So you could, you know, so the way I do things is I'm very blunt. I'd say, hey, I thought I liked you. Okay? I think you're actually cute. I would give us another chance. Do you want to or not? Just let me know. Hmm? Yeah. That's a skill, a game skill that you got from an area of explosion and smoke. Hmm? when you see life that way, then the only purpose of life is for you to become the best gamer you can become. Mm. Whether it's dating, career, podcasting, writing books, whatever it is, okay? The, 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 the purpose of life is not what the modern world tells you. It's the Western modern world. The Western modern world will tell you that the purpose of your life, meaning, is for you to set a target and chase it all of your life. Feel miserable all of your life until you reach it. Yeah. And then when you reach it, you're either miserable for the rest of your life because you have no purpose. Yeah. Or you set another purpose that you're miserable for the rest of your life until you achieve. Right? It doesn't work at all. The purpose of life is I'm going to play every moment of this game not to finish the level, not to get, to get more coins, hmm? but to become the absolute best gamer I can become. So that when I play the next time, I'm a better gamer. And the next time, yeah. I'm a better gamer such a good metaphor because with all those experiences you acquire skills and with those skills you can level up 100 percent. and yeah i just think um as you were speaking then a quote came to mind and and jimmy carr was asked what is the meaning of life and he said i'll tell you in five words enjoying the passage of time <laughs> exactly and that's all we can really do in, in, in enjoying in a way that is fully immersed. Mm. Don't mix the word enjoying with having fun and going to the pub. To the pub. Mm. That's not what it mm-hmm. is. Okay? Uh, they're, they're in enjoying the passage of time. By the way, compounding, especially for young people, is the most missed opportunity ever. Compounding. Uh, of course. Because a skill that I learn when I'm 20 and apply when I'm 21 and 22 and 23 and 27 and 29, not only is more used more in my life, Mm? But I learn it when, I t- when I'm 20 and it enables me to learn another skill in 21 and another skill in 22 and another t- skill when I'm 33, uh, 23 and so on. So by the time I'm 29, I've learned 200 skills when my colleague hasn't even learned skill number one yet. Mm, that makes sense. Okay. So when I, when I graduated without mentioning names, mm, I, I graduated from engineering university. One of my uh, colleagues and I started on the same day at IBM. Okay. The only difference between me and him is that he wanted to go and spend two hours a day on the cafe watching football. Mm-hmm. That was the purpose of his 20s. Finish work, two hours at the cafe watching football. Okay? One of my uh, uh, um, choices at that time was I'll spend an hour taking care of my body and an hour taking care of my brain. Yeah. Okay? So if every day that passes, I spent one hour reading or watching a documentary or doing something which most people will call boring. <laughs> okay? But the compounding, hmm? because when we were in our late 30s, I had tens of thousands of hours of more knowledge than he did. Yeah, it makes sense. It, it's the compounding. Huh? And understand that when I was in my 40s and I would read the book, I would read it six times faster than he would because... I've acquired so much skill in reading. I've acquired so much skill 
uh, so much knowledge about the topic that the book is about. Okay, so so everything is now ten x faster, ten x you know orders of magnitude more. Mm. Okay, compounding makes a huge difference. So when you're playing the game, hmm, like we said with dating, every experience is an experience of reflection that turns into a learning, and that yeah. learning. Mm? enables you to go into the next experience not presumption uh, not pre presumptuous I don't know the English word right but simply saying I have a point of reference and I want to compare if this one is narcissistic too or not <laughs> okay and and simply because of that knowledge mm, I get another data point and I go like oh interesting there are two types okay or, or no un interesting i was wrong about the first one it's always a a, a a a question of reflection real gamers i'm a very serious gamer okay uh, like in in the game i play i'm two of every million players have a chance to beat me okay the reason is i don't play the game for any reason other than my skills so i would get stuck in a simple bit of the game okay yeah. say a f 70 second stretch of the game okay I'd play it a hundred times, like an Olympic athlete. Yeah. Okay. To get that hundred seconds of the game perfect, <laughs> right? To get the skill to be permanent. Okay. And yeah, after th the third time, it sort of becomes easy. I'd still play it a hundred times. Mm. Right. That that is what life is about. Hmm? What life is about is acquiring skills, applying them, and affirming them. And yeah. then taking them to apply, to, to gain more skills, and then taking them to gain more skills. And skills here are not academic. Dating is a skill. Loving is a skill. Friendship is a skill. Listening is a skill. Mm -hmm. Stopping the judgment of the modern world to judge everything and be rude about everything is a skill. To be open to the opinion of someone who contradicts you is a skill. Okay? Take all of those things and build a person that's able to be put in every situation, acquire as much knowledge as possible, get as much favor from the people around them as possible, and and really produce the maximum thing you can do because it's your personal best. I love it. That's such a good message to end on. Thank you so much. I know, as you explained at the beginning, that your mission is one billion happy, and uh, count me as one of them. But um, <laughs> Great. I just, I, I'm, I, as I said to you when I first met you, I'm, I love your work. I love everything you're doing, and I think this, this mission that you're on really works because I listened to you on podcasts, shared it with my mom, and then my mom shared it with her boyfriend, and then my auntie got hold of it, and it's like this domino effect. And I just think it's so wonderful that that all of these people are being impacted in such a positive way by what you're doing so thank you so very much and thank you for this conversation today it's been amazing thanks for having me it's been a, a lovely coincidence that we met and even lovelier than we're that we're doing this today thank you